Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. My next guest has been married for 19 years and has four children ages 17 to 3. She has lived in Utah, Wyoming, Texas, and is now back in Utah again. All of her children have severe food allergies and eosinophilic esophagitis or eosinophilic gastroenteritis. Those are a mouthful. They're also known as EOE or PGE. This sparked a joy and a need for baking and cooking in her home. She also loves to work in her garden. An interesting fact about her is that she and her family were on the show Random Axe and had a bake-off with the Random Axe crew, which I must say they won. I am pleased to present Suzanne Earle. Suzanne, are you ready to share your story of hope? Yes, I am. Thank you for talking with me today. On a personal note, Suzanne and I met when our families lived in Texas, and when I found out that I did not tolerate wheat very well, she taught me how to make a gluten-free mixture before it became a thing that you could buy at the store. So uh, she is like the baking queen. She knows the science of baking. She's had to learn this because of her children. And she is just amazing. So I consider her a wonderful and great friend. We're excited to have you today, Suzanne. And I just have to ask, how in the world did your family get on TV? Tell me that story really quick. (laughs) That was really fun. It was such a special experience. So my older daughter, Christine, got onto a website and she nominated her little sister, Brooklyn, to be a Random Acts recipient. Mm. Um, because she knew that we we love baking shows. I read lots of cookbooks, and I watch baking shows like I'm taking a college class. <laughs> I pay attention to all the science and every little thing that they do, and I learn new ways to do things. So, And we like to quote, especially um, the British Baking Contest or the oh. British Baking Show. We quote that all the time. So, but we always knew that something like that Brooklyn could never do because she's just allergic to too many of the ingredients. So they set up, they called and they said that they would like to do it with Brooklyn, but I had to get involved with it so that they can make sure all the ingredients were safe. And um, I provided most of the ingredients from home and they went and bought some of the ingredients that we felt like they could buy. And they did it in their studio and they built a kitchen inside their studio so that we would have a safe place to bake. Wow. That's and amazing. all the ingredients were safe for her to use. So it was really an amazing experience. It was really fun. That's so fun. That's so awesome. That yeah, you it really was that. really very fun. <laughs> we'll for sure have to put a, a link in the show notes to to this episode of Random Acts so that people, if they want to see that episode yeah, with the it. family, uh-huh. would, yeah, that would be really fun. That would be really cool. So let's kind of go back into your story. You got married and here you were ready to start a family and just the process of starting your family didn't go as you had thought or planned. Why don't you no. talk me through there? Let's start okay. there. And it took us a few years because it turns out I have polycystic ovarian syndrome, but it was kind of asymptomatic, so I didn't know I had it, but my body doesn't normally ovulate. Oh. So I had to take um, a lot of medications to get my body to do that. So it took a few years to figure that out. And so with each of my kids, well, each of my girls... Uh, my first two girls, we did that. And it was, it's always kind of hard because when you're working with your doctors and you're thinking we want to have a baby, it takes a lot of appointments mm. um, to do that and medications and watching your, your levels and things. Um, and then we, we did get our two girls that way. And then my son was a complete surprise. Oh. So, because I normally don't ovulate, I never had, you know, regular periods. And so I was 15 weeks pregnant when I found out with him. Wow. 
Yeah. So, and then two of my kids, he was born a preemie at 35. So it was a very short pregnancy for me. <laughs> and then my last one, um, the doctors wouldn't give me any more fertility medications. Hmm. And so we knew that we wanted another baby though, but it took us um, 10 years of trying to get her until we finally moved and finally found a doctor that was willing to work with us longer. Um, and I was able to get some of those medications again. And we did get pregnant with twins, <laughs> which was really fun. But unfortunately, we lost one of them about 12 weeks, oh. which kind of sparked a, a, almost a race to keep our, our last little one. So it was a lot of shots and a lot of bed rest and a lot of appointments, a lot of stress tests every week to make sure everything was going well. And she was also born early, but she made it. And so now we have our four kids. That is quite a labor. And once you got them here, it wasn't as easy either, right? <laughs> no, because I couldn't feed them. <laughs> oh my goodness. So this whole process is, it just blows my mind because most most babies, you know, you nurse them and they're fine and you start, you know, start them on rice cereal and everything is great. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell me how that looked for your family? For Christine, it started with just food allergies and she, she struggled a lot as a baby, but we didn't really know why. Um, and then when she was about 15 months old, she was playing with a granola bar just that, that my husband had set down on the coffee table and she just broke out in hives from head to toe. Wow. And so, and that was when we were very first introduced to the world of food allergies oh, yeah. in general. So she was allergic to peanuts at, with that. And it seemed from there, they were just gaining allergies. They didn't ever grow out of allergies like you heard, hear a lot of. It just seemed to get more and more and more. We just found more and more things hmm. that they, she was struggling to make her sick. And we started carrying EpiPins and going to lots of allergist appointments and learning how to cook a lot once we had to take out egg and dairy and soy and corn and oats. That was the first one. Wow. And realizing there's very little you can buy for a toddler at the store. Yeah. Without all those things. And so, you know, to survive, we had to figure out how to cook and what we were going to make. Wow. And it, yeah. And then when my second daughter, when she was born and she actually did pretty good until she was about two. And then she just started dramatically losing weight and just throwing up and she cried all the time. Oh. And we had doctors telling us, well, she must be allergic to foods. And we said, well, we're pretty aware of food allergies. And we've had her tested. And soy came up, but that was the only thing that came up. Now, was this a blood test or a skin we test? We do blood tests and skin tests so mm -hmm. that we can get a bigger picture. And um, they kept saying, well, it's something you haven't tested yet. It's something you haven't found. And I remember I got just so desperate one time because... I, she was at my parents' house for a barbecue and she ran up to my dad and she touched the outside of the grill and she burned her hands really badly and she didn't even cry. <gasps> and I thought if she's hurting that much inside that she doesn't notice that on her hand, she's hurting all the time. Mm. And so, um, we started getting, you know, going to more doctors and things, trying to figure out what was going on. And I had a good friend in Texas say, that sounds a lot like what my son has. And it was called eosinophilic esophagitis. Mm. So I went to the allergist and he did a random blood test that showed she did have really high eosinophils. But high eosinophils means that there's inflammation just somewhere in the blood. Mm. So then we went to a different doctor at Texas Children's Hospital and he came in and I started telling him what was going on and he said, don't tell me anything. And I, I was kind of confused and okay. he said, don't tell me anything these doctors have told you because if they were right, you wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And I said, thank you. <laughs> So that was the first, that was one of her first endoscopies was that, and they did find the eosinophilic esophagitis, which is eosinophils in the esophagus. 
and then the eosinophilic gastroenteritis, which is in her stomach. So it's basically inflammation of the esophagus and the stomach. Yeah, the esophagus and stomach, yes. And it's caused by the food you're eating. So the purpose of an eosinophil is it's a white blood cell that fights parasites and uh-huh. viruses. It thinks that when you're eating food, the food you're eating is attacking you. Oh so it fights goodness. back with white blood cells. It's wow. weird. <laughs> And so, but what happens is these white blood cells all gather together and they cause inflammation and pain. But if they reach the surface, which is called the granulation, they actually release toxins, which will make you very, very sick. Oh my goodness gracious. And so this is what was happening. This is what was happening. Yes. And so, but it was a night and day difference. We made the choice at that time to um, put her, get her on a G-tube. So okay, why don't you stomach. describe what that is? So a G-tube is a feeding tube that just goes straight into your stomach mm-hmm. and has a little port on the outside that you connect tubing to so that when she was fed, it would go straight into her stomach. And the reason for that is because she was put on a special formula called Neocate that mm-hmm. had no food proteins in it that she could react to, but it smells like stinky feet and it tastes like vomit. It's oh my God. Gosh. Yeah, it's no really wonder it nasty. goes straight into the stomach. <laughs> yes, because then she wouldn't have to drink it. Mm. So, but it was a night and day difference. We took food out of her diet and she stopped eating regular food and she became the happiest, sweetest little girl. Wow. That I hadn't seen before in her. Wow. How old was she at this point, Suzanne? She was four. Four. Mm-hmm. Now, I remember when. When our family knew your family in Texas, that I remember you talking me through what a hard thing this was for her because so many of the things that we do socially revolve around food. Yeah. So why don't you why don't you talk us through what that looked like for her at that point? Well, it's, you know, it's hard because she's in kin- she was in kindergarten by the time she got her feeding tube, she was diagnosed at four. And I remember her when she when she was put in kindergarten, there's so many class parties and teachers hand out treats all the time. Where when we were just our family at home, we just made it normal life. Mm-hmm. You know, that this is Brooklyn's food and that's how Brooklyn eats. Mm-hmm. And during that time, you know, from when she was diagnosed to getting her feeding tube is when my other kid daughter was diagnosed as well with her food allergies and then Brooklyn started gaining food allergies as well so she has both food allergies and the EOE and EGE so but with my kids being little we just made it a normal thing at our house that this is this person's food and this is Brooklyn's food and this is mom and dad's food and we never share and that's okay because everybody eats a little different Mm -hmm. But when she went to kindergarten, that's when things really started changing because everyone was in the lunchroom eating all the same foods. And there were class parties and she couldn't participate in the snacks and parents brought in treats for birthdays and she couldn't eat any of them. And that's when I think it first became hard for her. And we had to start kind of hitting more that everybody has trials and things that they have to go through. So just because her friends were eating foods didn't necessarily mean that they weren't dealing with something on their own. Mm, that's, so, a, that's a pretty tough concept for a kid in kindergarten to figure out. It is. Yeah. But we, whether good or bad, we actually know a lot of people with lots of other disabilities. I have a niece with cystic fibrosis. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had, you know, friends that have had cancer and things. So we would, we would point that out. You know, we'd say, look at, look at Alyssa. She has cystic fibrosis, but she doesn't have food allergies mm. or look at TJ. He's missing a foot, but he doesn't have food allergies, but you have two feet. And so pointing out the difference in people and things that she could see helped her become very empathetic towards other people and the things that they were going through. Mm. What's cool about you learning how to teach this concept to your children is that you've now incorporated this into a book. In fact, Suzanne's book, The Climb, will be released towards the end of 2020. So 
if you have a child that you are trying to explain this concept of everyone has challenges, they just look a little bit differently, watch for Suzanne's book at the end of 2020, The Climb. I have always loved your creativity, Suzanne. (laughs) And I remember you got very creative. In fact, I remember you telling me about a birthday party you had for her and you made like a paper cake. (laughs) Yes, (laughs) we made, but it was like the slices were like little boxes and that all together formed a cake. And inside we just put little non-food treats and prizes. (laughs) So you really had to get creative and think outside the box, not only for stuff like birthday parties, also for for cooking. You had to figure out ways to bake for a family that where everybody had allergies. Yeah. Sorry, you should know that all these cute little noises in your in the background. It's my cute little three year old. Brooklyn has food allergies and the EOE and EGE. And my older daughter Christine has the food allergies and EOE. And then my son, he actually is allergic to, um, it sounds weird, but it's ibuprofen, but it's salicylates. Oh. So ibuprofen and aspirin is made from salicylic acid. Yes. It's the man-made version of what naturally incurs in food that is anti-inflammatory in your food. So it's actually a lot of your most healthy foods, unfortunately, are full of salicylates. And they will make him very sick. And if he gets enough of them, he'll have an allergic reaction to that. So he has a whole different set of foods. And then my youngest, even though she's only three, she's already off of wheat and dairy and potatoes and carrots and apples. And we don't know 100% why yet. (laughs) Oh, wow. That is just a lot to take in. So let me pause right there and just ask you. What was going through your mind with all of these diagnoses? I mean, I can imagine that my thoughts would have been one wasn't enough. How about two? What about three? All of my kids have food allergies. I mean, was there ever a point where you're just like, dear God, what are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) What, what, What was going on? That would be what I was thinking. But what, what was going through your mind at this point? I think having a good attitude helped me a lot. And also, I didn't receive it all at once. Mm. And I think that helped a lot. So when my kids were first getting allergies and they were getting more and more and more allergies, it seemed for some reason to just kind of be one at a time. Mm. We never received this diagnosis of, oh, now you have 10 things you're allergic to. Um, It kind of built, it built gradually on us. But I can remember a time when Brooklyn was first diagnosed and I, I sat and I cried. Because I was like, I don't even know how to go forward from here. There's so, and she didn't have her feeding tube yet. And I was just told she's going to need to not eat any food. And this is a formula. And they sent us home with the sample. And it was so awful. And I thought, I can't even give this to her. I wouldn't even drink it. I can't imagine anyone drinking this. It's so nasty. And, um, but, you know, to make the decision to get a feeding tube put in, we had no idea how long that was going to last either. Right. So, you know, you're looking at a very long-term solution. And I, I sat and I cried. And I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, how many more things are we going to have to deal with? Mm. And I don't know. I got, I, at that point, with a, a lot of prayer and things like that, we kind of got a lot of answers And it became very clear to me that this was temporary. Mm. That at the moment, it seemed very long-term to me. But in the long-term, it's temporary. She wasn't always going to have a feeding tube. We were eventually going to find foods that she could eat. And there would always come a point later where none of it was needed anymore. Mm. And I needed to look at a bigger picture. And then when I started to look at a bigger picture, it gave me a lot of hope mm. and, um, and a lot more faith to keep going on every day. So the each thing that came upon after that was just, I look at it as, well, this is our big, long journey. And this is one more step forward towards an ultimate goal of not needing this anymore. Wow. So so you feel that God just kind of helped you expand your horizon instead of looking at that specific yeah. problem to say, I want you to realize down the road, this will be different. And so yeah. you just have to keep your eye on that goal. Yeah. 
Wow. And it's taken 10 years, but this last April, Brooklyn did have her feeding tube removed. Wow. Um, And we've had over 30 endoscopies and we have failed because the only way to trial a food was to eat it Mm. and then do an endoscopy to see what was happening inside her body with it, with biopsies. So we would try to do about three foods at a time. But if she, but if the eosinophils increased, we had to take all three foods out of her diet because we wouldn't know which one it was. Mm. So sometimes we would try a new one again, but most of the time we could tell the food would make her sick right away. Some foods made her more sick than others, but she would get very sick. So how long did you have to try a food for to know it was safe? So we would start with, it usually took about six months to find out if the food was safe all the way. Wow. So we would start with testing. We always allergy tested it first because she does have true food allergies. Mm -hmm. And so we would do a blood test and a skin test. And then we would do what's called a patch test where they put the actual food underneath the patch on her back for 48 hours. Oh. And then they would remove it and then wait 24 hours and then come back and see what it looks like. Mm. And every once in a while, you would see the redness and the bumpiness of things where those eosinophils would move outward to her skin, and you could see there if she was reacting to it or not. And so then you just eliminate, you didn't even try those at that point. Yeah, we wouldn't even try those. If she reacted on any of those, we didn't even try those. But unfortunately, it it gave us a better direction, but it wasn't a guarantee. So then Mm -hmm. she would have to eat the food. And if she ate it for about... I would say about a month and she did fine. Then we would move on to the next food Mm. and you would start. And so about every, we would try to do that. And it usually would take us about six months because some foods would make her sick. And if they'd make her sick, it usually took her about a month to recover enough that we felt like she wasn't react, having any more reaction in her body from that food. And then we could try a new food. So yeah, so some give or take, it usually takes us about a six months between endoscopies where we would where we'd say we finally think we have three foods that are mm. good. And then sometimes we would find out, nope, your eosinophils have increased. There's still something you're reacting to. And sometimes it would be great and we would add those foods to our, this is a safe food list. Wow. So how many foods can Brooklyn eat now safely? So she had her feeding tube while we were doing this. We're still trialing now. Sure. Um, But right now she has 22 safe foods. And that includes items like sugar and salt, baking soda, um, and things like that that don't have any food proteins in them all. And some flavorings like mint um, and maple flavorings because everything has to be tested. So she has 22 items. Spices. Yeah, spices. Yeah, so she just, she passed nutmeg, but she did not pass cinnamon. Mm. Who knows why? (laughs) So she has 22 foods that she can eat and about 83 that she can't. There you go. But this is, like you say, this is a journey. And so- This is a journey, yes. You are constantly testing to see what foods you can add. Yes. Okay, so this helps our listeners gain just a little bit of appreciation for learning to bake with limited ingredients. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and why this bake off was so challenging for the random axe crew because yeah. <laughs> you really only have a small, small window of foods that you can. Yes, and have. they're foods that you're not used to using, which was interesting for them. Yeah. So why don't you talk me through an example of, of, um, of a meal that Brooklyn can eat now? Um, and what you have to do to prepare that. (laughs) It'd be more like for my family. I kind of can't cook for everyone in my family all at once. Mm. So I make big batches of food. And we stick things in in the freezer and in the fridge so that I can focus on who am I feeding for this meal. And then whoever can't eat this meal can get something from the fridge or the freezer. Gotcha. 
because okay. I can't feed everyone at the same time. But one of the things we do try to do is spaghetti. Mm -hmm. But spaghetti at our house is kind of laughable, but we do it anyway because it's something everyone can eat, sort of. Mm -hmm. Sort of. <laughs> so we have two pots. We have one pot with regular noodles and we have one pot with rice noodles. Okay. And we have to make sure we keep our colanders for straining and our stirring utensils separate. Mm. So Brooklyn can have the rice noodles and my youngest daughter has the rice noodles and everyone else can have regular. And we all could have rice noodles, but it's more expensive to do so. Yes, it is. They're expensive. So we try to keep those to just the two that need them. And then we make just a pan of hamburger mm -hmm. um, separate so that Everyone can have hamburger, but it can't be mixed into things. So, and then we have two different sauces. We have one sauce that has things like the spices and things in it, and one sauce, that, one sauce that's just tomato and salt. And then we have cheese for those who can have cheese, but not everyone can have cheese. So in general, it's a lot of dishes, but somebody should be able to get something to eat. Wow. That is unbelievable. <laughs> That blows my mind. Seriously, you have the patience of Job. <laughs> yes. I know. You, you've had to gain the patience of Job. Let me put it that way, because I'm sure at the beginning, you're like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lessons learned from all of this craziness. You've mentioned that everyone has trials, and mm -hmm. that's something that you started teaching Brooklyn when she was five and had to have the feeding tube. Everyone has trials. Yes. They don't look the same. Not all of them are visual trials, right? Yes. Um, what are some of the other lessons? So one thing that we we really learned is that not only do our trials make us human, but they make us normal. And so my kids have learned that even with a feeding tube or a different food, things that doesn't make them different than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And Brooklyn was in PE one time um, and they were changing clothes and a girl looked at her and she says, what is that? Pointing mm -hmm. to her feeding tube. Mm -hmm. And instead of getting embarrassed, Brooklyn lifted up her pants and said, these are pants. Because <laughs> it didn't even occur to her that there was something different that she that would be looked at that would right. be that strange, and so she was trying to figure out why is this girl interested in my pants, you know? Mm. And I was so proud of her for that, you know, that mm. she didn't see anything different between herself and the girls next to her, mm -hmm. you know, and changing and things that it was. Um, that it was just, she just knew that she was, that's the way she was and other people were different and that's okay. That's what makes us all unique and special. That is awesome. I remember when we were in Texas together, you taught me a lesson that I actually included in my book, Normal for Me, about lemons and lemonade. Do you mind sharing that lesson? Oh, that's a simple lesson we hear a lot, but um we it was teaching my kids that, you know, you hear a lot that if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Mm -hmm. um, so we would look around at people to say, well, you can't make lemonade without sugar. So look around you and see what's the sugar. Do you have a helper in your life? Do you have a good friend? Do you have a parent? Do you have a, a, a teacher at school? And those are the sugar that helps us turn lemons into lemonade. Because mm. without sugar, you wouldn't have very good lemonade. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. It would be awfully tart. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be kind of gross. <laughs> I know, right? Yes. It's so true. But but it helps us to look for those little gifts that God sends us through other people or mm -hmm. through just little miracles. Um, you know, we just need to look for them sometimes. And yeah. we'll find them, right? Exactly. A lot of ours have just been reaching out to other people and being able to help other people when they first get a diagnosis of an EOE or food allergies. Or sometimes we've had people contact us who are thinking of getting a feeding tube and want to know what it's like. Mm. And I remember when Brooklyn did start kindergarten, we were extremely blessed because it's such a rare disease in the first place. But actually her kindergarten teacher, her daughter had the same thing Brooklyn did and had a feeding tube. 
Really? I, what yes. are the odds? Seriously. What are the odds? That that truly was just a blessing, straight up. There was no other way because I was so nervous to send her to school. Oh yeah. And and I have to deal with all this. Her kindergarten teacher came to my home before school started. And it was about the time we were getting the feeding tube. And she showed me how to change the feeding tube because you'd have to change it in and out of their stomach at home every three months. Wow. And she showed us how to do it. And she showed us how to use the pump. And she talked about what they would do in class and how they would make Brooklyn comfortable. And that made such a big difference in sending her to school. And that was one of my first big lessons about looking for sugar is looking for those blessings. Mm Mm-hmm around you that what a coincidence that was and I don't even believe it was a coincidence I think that was divine design yeah to have an experience like that yeah so that almost feeds into your next lesson you listed that we are not alone in our hard times Mm -hmm. (laughs) tell me tell me how you learned that besides this beautiful lesson that you just taught about (laughs) the feeding tube and the teacher Well, I was surprised when we started talking to people about our trials and they would say things like, oh, I know someone with this allergy or I'm allergic to this or I've been finding that this is a problem and how we were able to help each other. Hmm. And it seemed that it didn't even matter if it was a rare disease or with food allergies or whatever it was. It didn't matter. People seemed to come out of the woodwork. And I actually, my sister described it to me like this. She said, sometimes you just feel like you're drowning in just everything, everything that's going on. You're, you're just drowning in it. And when someone comes up to you and says, I know how you feel, it's like taking a breath of air. Mm. You're coming up. It's like you can breathe just because you don't feel like you're having to explain yourself to somebody all the time. You know, no, we're not going to share our food. No, we're not going to come to this party. Or yes, we're bringing all our own ingredients or our own food. And it just sometimes feels like there's a constant run on of explanations. Mm. And it's like a breath of fresh air when you can talk to somebody that just says, I know how you feel. Yeah. And it's like, you can just breathe. You can just relax and be like, I don't have to try and explain everything today. (laughs) Yeah. And I think even even if it's not the same trial, just just the fact that somebody comes to you and says, I know how you're feeling. That is beautiful. That is so, so amazing. And I found that to be true too. It's just nice. Um, like when I meet a fellow parent with kiddos with autism, you don't have to explain why your child is flapping their arms and waving it in front of an object that is doing a repetitive motion. They just love it and they're stimming in front of it. And you kind of look at each other and you kind of do like a fist bump or something because you're like, I don't even have to explain my son to you because you totally get it. So it is nice. You're right. I've never heard it described (laughs) as a breath of fresh air, but that's totally what it is. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Now you also mentioned that you learned that it's okay to cry Mm -hmm. and vent and kind of get all those emotions out and let people know what you're going through. Yes. How did you learn that? Well, and actually that was also for my sister about the same time we were talking about it being like a breath of fresh air. Um, We moved to Utah and about the time we moved to Utah, her son had also been sick and was also recent and then was diagnosed with food allergies and EOE. Mm. And the first thing she did was call me and she was crying and she said, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have you here to talk to about it, just to simply talk, Mm. not to solve the problem, not to tell her that everything's going to be okay, not to tell her that it's not going to be hard, but just to simply be there, someone to listen to and have one say, I know how you feel. And sometimes you just need to cry a little. And I think, especially as moms, we bear a lot of the burden of putting a smile on our face through trials, Mm. especially for our kids and in teaching them that everything is just fine and everything's normal and that it's, you know, we're going to make it through this, Mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, we failed another food. (laughs) You're really (laughs) sick again type of thing. It, It can be really hard. And there's been more than once I've sat and cried and 
my daughter will come and she'll sit and cry with me. <laughs> She's so good at that. And she says, I know mom. Um, she goes, let's go make something. Let's go cook. Mm-hmm. You know, and she gets up and she does something. But that release of emotions and knowing that it's okay to recognize once in a while, that it's okay to sit and cry. Mm-hmm that that's also part of being human is that you don't have to be strong all the time. Right. No, I, I totally agree with you. Um, sometimes I think there's a mentality that you have to be strong and put that strong face yeah. on all the time. And you know what? That's just not real. <laughs> it's not. And it's not realistic either. Like no one can go, like even doctor's appointments will be exhausting but you'll come home from the hospital just exhausted. Yeah. Because emotionally it takes so much energy to put on that face. We're happy, you know, we're excited for this new food or we failed this food or whatever it is that people are going through. It doesn't matter how much of a face you put on every once in a while, you need to, you need that release, but it's okay to cry. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) It is. It is. It is. Absolutely. We're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, would you mind talking me through some of the tips you would give to people who are in a similar situation and things that you do differently now than perhaps you did when you first got married? Yes. (laughs) Awesome. How many of you out there feel like your life is chaotic, crazy, and completely awful compared to the norm? What if I were to tell you that you are normal for you? I am so excited to announce that my book, Normal For Me by Tamara K. Anderson is now available for purchase on Amazon. This book took me 10 years to write and I share 20 years worth of lessons learned in my life detours, including being in a car accident and having two of my children diagnosed on the autism spectrum. In this book, I share the secrets of how I made it from despair to peace with God's help. I also include a bonus diagnosis survival guide at the very end of my Normal For Me book. The diagnosis survival guide includes 12 tips to survive and thrive in tough times. Wouldn't you like to know what those are? So what are you waiting for? Grab your copy of Normal For Me today on Amazon. And we're back. I'm talking to Suzanne Earle about having children with food allergies and EOE and EGE. And over the break, we were talking about how she likes to read everything when she's cooking. And we got to talking about resources. So I thought we'd jump back in first and and talk about some of these resources that she has found really helpful as she has learned the science of cooking. Do you have like specific resources or YouTube channels that you've watched a lot that you found to be very helpful that you could recommend and stuff like that? I I look up everything. You look up everything? Everything. Like I get all the cookbooks. Like we recently did the Marie Kondo um, where you're trying to get rid of a lot of stuff in your house that you just don't need. And I couldn't get rid of any of my cookbooks. (laughs) <laughs> and I have like this this whole like bookshelf to them and my husband's like but you never look through them and I said oh no you don't see me look through them I look through them when you're at work <laughs> but for example I remember when I was trying to come up with a potato salad recipe and I just could not find any ideas until finally I saw one that was like a German potato salad that used a vinaigrette instead of a mayonnaise Oh. You know, and then it gets the juices flowing. You're like, oh, what if we did something like this instead? And they couldn't use all the rest ingredients in that recipe, but it helps you think a lot about why that was working. Right. And I get a lot of ideas and a lot, a lot of cooking shows. Um, the Alton Brown, The Good Eats is one of my favorite ones just because he goes into a lot of the science of why things work. And if you understand why the recipe is working the way that it is, it helps you recreate it in a different way. What was, what was his name again? The Alton Brown. Alton Brown. It's an old show called Good Eats. Very good. Um, Another one, there's a good book called um, 
but it's like the best of the best of home or the best taste of home or something like that. And that was a really good book because every recipe that they do, they explain why they're doing it and all their fails in trying to come up with the perfect recipe. Wow. And so that gives you ideas and thoughts and yes. stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's really cool. And we watch just lots of YouTube videos. I watch everything I can. So. So YouTube is a great resource. YouTube is a great resource because there's lots of people much better than me at doing things and especially at posting videos. But mm. <laughs> I, I love that. I've actually tried posting a couple of videos and I have not been very good at it so far. <laughs> <laughs> That is okay, right? Yes. <laughs> different people have different strengths. <laughs> yes. And other people are much better at making videos. And I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Okay. So what tips would you give as far as cooking in general? Tips in cooking in general is to be creative. Um for example, when my daughter only had rice as an ingredient that she could have, we used rice, rice flour, rice vinegar, rice syrup, um, and we expanded with different types of rice. You know, we tried brown rice and short grain rice and long grain rice and arborio rice and basmati rice. And to do that, even though she was just eating rice, she felt like it was fun and it was creative. Mm. She could try lots of different things. That is, I, when you, I never would have expanded just rice to all those things. So that, that is amazing. So you have to think a little bit outside the box there too. Yeah. Like we were able to make her pancakes and we made it with rice flour and sugar and then baking soda, which doesn't have any food proteins in it and rice vinegar. And it was very simple and it probably didn't taste Oh, you know, like what you would expect a big, thick, fluffy pancake to taste like, but the only protein in it was rice. <laughs> right. Right. Oh my goodness. That is awesome. Holy cow. So let me ask you this. How, how has your family changed and how, what do you do differently because of these challenges that, that you have with all the food allergies? Um, well, one thing we definitely do is we don't eat out very much. Mm. Um, there's a lot of risk in trying to explain to a chef or a cook about your allergies and why you can't eat certain things. And just personally, it's really hard for me to give somebody else that control. Mm. And that's been harder as they've gotten older because they want to be more self-sufficient they want to go do things with their friends sure uh, my 17 year old once you know she wanted to go on you know she went to homecoming and the first thought through my head was okay you've got a homecoming dress where you're going to put your epi pins <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> where you're going to go out to eat and mm -hmm. That's been a really hard thing for me. And so something recently we've been trying to do is we've been trying to reach out to more restaurants and places and teaching my kids how to navigate in a world that they have to do things differently that I've always done for them. Mm. So teaching them to be independent with some of this food yes, allergy. Yes, be more and independent with some stuff. of these things. And that's been really hard for me. <laughs> yeah. Because I've been I'm doing it myself for so long. But I, you know, people say things to me all the time, like, what are you going to do when they go to college? And I look at them and I say, I don't know. What should I do when they go to college? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> mm. uh, you know, what did they can do in high school? And I say, I don't know. Do you have ideas? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so that's been a big thing is I've had to reach out to other people a lot more lately. And I've had to let my kids be their own um, self-advocates lately. So that's something we've definitely tried at school this year is I didn't do training with the teachers this year. Um, my girls did their own training. Mm. And that was hard for me, but it's very good for them to learn to navigate with 
themselves in a way that they're still living at home and I can come in and I can help where needed. Right. But, but they're still, but they're still learning to do things on their own. Right. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That really, really is. <laughs> yeah. And I think I, you know, when you contact me and I thought about it, one thing we also do is we don't get invited places very often or to mm. friend's house or to go eat or even birthday parties. Um, my friend, you know, our, my girls never really got invited to very many birthday parties or, you know, play dates, sleepovers, things like that. They just, because it was always scary for a parent to invite them or they're wondering what you're going to eat or if you're going somewhere, we're bringing all our own food. And so we would invite people to our home often, mm. you know, come have dinner with us or come to our birthday party because we wanted people to know that we understand that it can be scary to invite us places and we may not even feel comfortable everywhere, but that doesn't mean we can't be friends mm -hmm. and we can still do things. We just maybe have to adjust it a little bit right. or maybe do an activity that doesn't involve food, which is hard because nearly everything involves food. Yeah. So that's something we try to do. Brooklyn likes to invite her friends over to cook at our house often. Mm -hmm. Because you know where the ingredients are coming from and it's safe. Yes. And that they're safe. <laughs> yes. So she can still have fun and do things with their friends. It's just in a little safer environment. Right. That's, that's admirable and so amazing that you guys are able to do that. It really, really is. Now, you mentioned also that some of your resources or things when you're feeling down is you listen to heart songs. Yes. Why don't you explain to me what those are? Well, I can remember one time um, my oldest daughter had a really, really bad allergic reaction and we had to take her to the emergency room and they were putting her on all these machines and they were giving her EpiPen shots and it was really very scary and I couldn't be in the room with her because mm. I was eight months pregnant oh. and they had all these machines and they were going to try and x-rays of her lungs and things. And I just remember how heartbreaking that was to watch outside the room. And yeah. I just felt just kind of lost. And, and then later we were listening to, it was a song that was the, the breath of heaven. Mm. And it just spoke to me because I was like, that's what I feel like. That's mm. something that I can understand because that song in a way that I think music has a way to speak directly to your spirit mm. that words can't mm -hmm. and there's a difference between somebody telling you everything's going to be okay and actually feeling that deep in your heart with the music and so every once in a while it doesn't happen very often but every once in a while there's a song that, you know, that just pops up that, you know, you're like, yep, I know exactly what that feels like. So and do you have like a playlist that has your heart songs on it for those days when things are just <laughs> awful? <laughs> I actually do. And it's on my iPad. Which the whole screen is cracked right now, so I can't pull it up. <laughs> I have to get that fixed because I'm actually not very good at remembering the names of the songs and the authors and things. My brain is like, I tell my kids, my brain's a big bucket of, of rocks and there's water in the rocks. And if you put in new rocks, water falls out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I have big things I have to remember and all the rest of it just washes away. <laughs> so if you want me to remember something new, something else has to wash away. So, so I'll tell you what, why don't you send me a list of your heart songs? Yes, that you love, I will do that. And we will put it in the show notes so that people can find that and listen to those as well if they are having a hard day. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because they are good songs and they, and they speak, at least they speak to me. And that's yeah. why I call them heart songs is because they're the songs that touched my heart. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So... What resources would you recommend to somebody who is just coming into a food allergy or an EOE or an EGE diagnosis? What would, what would you say to them? I would say um, hop on the internet and look up Facebook groups. Facebook groups connect you to people everywhere. And that's kind of like where it's 
you know, the term coming out of the woods or whatever, you know, like they just, they come out of everywhere. All of a sudden you're like, oh, there's hundreds of people that know about this and are dealing with this every day. And some are newly diagnosed like me and some are, and some have been dealing with this for a long time. But not only do these people know how you're feeling, but they have lots and lots of ideas and resources for you about which doctors they see or what kind of formulas they've tried or how they've tried this ingredient. Um, and especially for food allergies, it's been really good to find things that every once in a while there's a food that's not labeled correctly. And that'll be the first place we see it. Mm. That they'll say, I went to eat at this restaurant or I ate this food and my son had a reaction or my daughter had a reaction. And you, it puts everyone else on warning to know not to try that food until things are cleared up. Right. That's awesome. So your first go-to is finding those groups. Yes. On I'd Facebook other or other groups yes. where there are people that have been there and done that. A, it helps you not feel so alone. But B, they're a fantastic resource of knowledge. Yes. Um, for, for, uh, gosh, it's like you're tapping into thousands of brains at the same time, right? <laughs> and especially with the EOE, because it's treated in a lot of different ways. Mm. Um, for my, you know, for Brooklyn, she needed a G-tube and we needed to take all food out of her diet. Right. Um, for my daughter, Christine, we just, we were very luckily able to identify about six foods that she can't eat that she's not allergic to, but will make her sick. Mm. And with that, hers has been quite controlled. Um, I have one nephew with him that has it. He takes, he's what he takes a swallowed steroid and then still avoids some foods, but that way he's been able to avoid getting a a feeding tube. So I think there's a lot of different ways. And if you just go to a doctor who's not very knowledgeable and just tells you one way, if you're not very comfortable with that, it's good to talk to other moms and say, well, have you tried this? Mm -hmm. Or this was our experience. This is what we needed. And I think, cause not every doctor is going to be super knowledgeable about it. Right. Right. And I'm sure the specialists are probably few and far between. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is awesome. So Suzanne, you have just been amazing to talk to. If there are people who have just really resounded with this and want to reach out to you, where can they find you? So I do have a couple pages on, um, on Facebook that they're besides my name on Facebook, but they could always look up I do a Utah kids food allergy cooking class, um, which again, I have videos for it, but I'm not very good at it. So I haven't That's okay. it in a while, but you're always welcome to get on there and ask questions and gather ideas. And that kind of grew from teaching kids how to cook because mm -hmm. they are going to need to cook for themselves. Yes. Anyway, that's a great place to ask questions if they look it up or if they want to connect. That's a good one. Awesome. So your page is Utah Kids Food Allergy Cooking Class. Yeah. And you have long. one other page, right? The other one is just called The Bread Lady. Just The Bread Lady. Yeah. I, I make and I sell lots of bread just because I had to learn how to make bread and kind of developed a talent for it. So, and because we can't buy bread from the store. Right. There's, there's too many ingredients my kids can't have. So we learned how to make bread, and so I do that. So if you can have wheat, it's a great resource. I have recipes on there, lots of good fun things, um, but it's also a way to connect to me if you awesome. want to send me a Very message. Very good. So you make wheat bread, but do you, you also make wheat-free bread? I Bread is really hard for me to make gluten-free Mm. Um, I make wheat bread just as bread, but I have found that I just can't replace that texture at home for mm. bread, but I do post on there the gluten-free muffins and pancakes and cookies and lots of things that are gluten-free. Um, I always have to clean my kitchen completely in between the days that I cook with wheat and the days that I cook with milk. Cause like I said, I have some that can have some ingredients and some that can't have others. So right. It depends on which day I'm cooking. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. 
Wow. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne. Are there any last tips or thoughts or ideas you'd like to share before we sign off? I would say the biggest one I have is don't forget to pray. Mm. Every day when you get up and every night when you go to sleep, ask for help. Ask for that hope that you need to have it with the hope through the hard times and ask for inspiration. A lot of the ideas I have for food and ingredients come while I'm asleep because that's the only time I think God can communicate with me best is when I'm not too busy. Mm. (laughs) And I think saying those prayers before I go to sleep and in the morning asking for inspiration has made a lot of difference in my life. Yeah, I bet it has. How have you found that he helps and comforts you besides giving you inspiration? Um, I think like we, we kind of talked before, the knowledge that the things that we're dealing with in this life were temporary. And that Tamara was something that especially you taught me when mm. we lived in Texas. It's always helped me. And I remember you quoting one time that somebody said, God won't give us anything we can't handle. And you looked at that person and you said, that's absolutely incorrect. (laughs) And you said, God's not going to give us anything we can't handle without his help. Mm. And that's been true every day in my life. And every time I go through something hard, that's what I draw back on is that God's not going to give me anything I can't handle with him and so with his help and that I need to draw on that and I need to get strength from that because that's what the atonement is for and why you know we were sent here on this earth is to learn and grow but not do it alone yeah absolutely oh well I'm glad that you you found some help yeah. with that and I have found that statement to be true <laughs> yes <laughs> That is awesome. Well, thank you, Suzanne. This has been so amazing and wonderful. And my heart just goes out to you and your family. I st- it still just blows my mind that you handle all these food allergies and cooking and learning all these new tricks and trades with such amazing optimism and just hope. So thank you for sharing your story. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. I know that there are many of you out there that are going through a hard time, and I hope you found things that have been useful today as you listen to the podcast. If you would like to access the show notes from today's podcast, visit my website. It is storiesofhopepodcast.com. That is where you'll find favorite quotes from today's episode and shareable memes. And those are fun because you can share them with your friends on social media. You will also find the links mentioned throughout today's episode so you don't have to remember what those were. And also all the tips that were shared. Sometimes tips are shared so much throughout an episode you forget. What were those great things? So go to the show notes, storiesofhopepodcast.com to look up these fantastic resources. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode... Perhaps that means that you should share this with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a tip that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this episode with them. May God bless you, especially if you are struggling with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going when things get tough. Remember to walk with Christ and he will help bear that burden Above all else, remember, God loves you.